Hi, in this problem we're going to prove that these functions are linearly independent. And there's a couple ways to do this. We're going to give a direct proof, show that they are independent. So we're going to use the definition. So to use the definition, we start by assuming that we have a linear combination of these functions and it's equal to zero. So suppose, that we have say c sub one times e to the ax plus c sub two times e to the bx and this is equal to zero for some numbers c1, c2, let's just say they're real numbers so they're inside the set of real numbers and for all, for all x and R. So we're going to prove they're independent over the entire real line. I probably should have specified the interval at the beginning. So we're just going to prove um, they're linearly independent on the entire set of real numbers. Okay, so this equation has to hold for all x. Let's, let's do some algebra here. I'm going to go ahead and take this and subtract it over to the right-hand side. So then we have c sub 1 times e to the ax. And by the way, here we can assume a and b are not zero, just for simplicity. So we have c sub 1 uh, e to the ax equals negative c sub 2 e to the bx. Okay, and now we're, we're going to go ahead and divide both sides by e to the ax, just again for some clarity here. Whoops. e to the ax. So these go away. So we have c sub 1 equals negative c sub 2. And when you divide these, you subtract the exponents, okay? It's kind of like if you have x to the m over x to the n, it's x to the m minus n, except instead of x here, it's e. The bases are the same, so you subtract the exponents. So this is e to the bx minus ax. I'm going to write this a little bit cleaner down here in this line. So c sub 1 is equal to negative c sub 2 e. Let's go ahead and pull out the x. I'll write it like this, b minus a, and then times x. And so at this point, um, it's probably clear that um, the c's have to be zero. Let me explain why, but then we're actually going to go a bit further and justify it. So the left-hand side is constant, the right-hand side is not. So the only way this can be true is if both of the c's are zero. Again, the left-hand side is a constant, the right-hand side is not. The only way this is true is if both c's are identically zero. However, let's justify it. This equation has to hold for all x. So this is for all x in R. Remember, we said that at the beginning, right? That's part of the criteria for independence. And so if we can show that the c's are zero, that shows that um, the functions are independent, right? Whenever you have a linear combination of functions, zero equal to zero, if that holds for some c's and for all x, uh, if it follows that all of the c's are zero, then the functions are independent. So we're going to show now that all of the c's are zero. And we can do that by picking values for x. For example, um, pick, I don't know, let's see, uh, x equals zero. That's gonna give us c1 equals negative c2. And then we get e to the zero here, right? Because this is gonna be zero. So we get c1 equals negative c2. And so now we just need to pick another value. So let's let's just say pick, um, let's see. Oh, let's have fun with it. Uh, we know A is not equal to B. So let's pick X equals one over B minus A. That sounds fun. <laughs> Check this out. Just trying to make it look fun. So I haven't done this problem. So this is E, B minus A times one over B minus A, just to make it a little bit cool. C1 is equal to negative C2 times E. OK, 
Okay, so we have two equations now. We have that um, C1 is equal to negative C2, and C1 is equal to negative C2 times E. So that means that these are the same. Hence, negative C2 is equal to negative C2 times E. So um, that would mean, so if C2 is not zero, then we can divide by negative C2, we get uh, one equals E, a contradiction. Thus, C2 is equal to zero. It has to be zero, right? Because if it's not, then E is equal to one, which we know is false. So thus C2 is zero, and then that follows that C1 is equal to negative C2. So C1 is zero. So thus, both C1 and C2 are zero. So C1 is equal to zero, and C2 is equal to zero. So we started with a linear combination of functions that were identically equal to um, zero, right, the zero function. And it's true for all x and for some c's. And we showed that um, those c's, you know, they had to be zero, right? There was no choice there. It was forced. So this shows the functions, shows the functions are linearly independent. And there's other ways to prove this. Um, you can use the Ronskian to show this. That's probably what a lot of people like to do. I just wanted to give a direct proof, which is more work. And you know, you could definitely say it's more challenging than using the Ronskian. But um, you know, the easiest solutions are the best solutions. But I, I think this is more fun. It's more fun to go through and mess around with it and stuff like that. So anyways, I hope this has been helpful to someone out there who is uh, who happens to be learning <laughs> some of this stuff. Good luck.